Um, if you've been with us, we're going through the book of Colossians. And one of the things we've been talking about is what was happening in the Colossian church when Paul wrote this letter. Again, Paul is writing not simply as a, as a theologian. He's not just trying to write the, theology uh, for the sake of posterity in the church, although we benefit from that 2,000 years later. He's really writing as a pastor to a particular place because they had a particular issue. And in the Colossian church, they had allowed the culture to seep into their thinking about Jesus And it was changing not only their view of Jesus, but what it meant to be a Christian and what it meant to be the church. And so Paul is writing this letter to the Colossian church to correct their view of Jesus and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we've looked at how what has seeped into the church from the culture is this mix of pluralism and, and Judaism and all of these things kind of warping their view of the gospel. And I think if we stop for just long enough this morning, I know we're waking up. I think we would all realize, recognize, and admit that today our world is not that much different. That we, as 21st century American Christians who live in the buckle of the Bible Belt in Dallas, Texas, have allowed so much of our surrounding culture to seep into our view and understanding of Jesus and what it means to be a Christian. And so we've looked at some examples of what that looks like. We've talked about prosperity gospel and how our expectation that if you believe in Jesus, your life is going to get better has seeped into our thinking. And that is just simply not true. In fact, Paul expects that there to be suffering and persecution in the life of believers. Uh, We've talked about how this world that we live in, um, as it seeps into our thinking, Uh, It causes us to think that we have to do a certain thing or be a certain way in order to earn our salvation. That's not the gospel. The gospel is free for us. It's been given to us out of grace and it's called for us to believe. This morning as we think about these things, what I want you to begin to wrestle with, again, each, each time that we talk about this, I want you to begin to wrestle with, how has your thinking of Jesus been warped by the surrounding culture. And and doing that project, really thinking about that honestly is difficult because it requires us to do some introspection. We live in the buckle of the Bible Belt. We live in a place where it's still common to be a Christian. Now that's changing with each passing generation, but we're still there. We, We live in a city where you are not going to experience very much persecution. And while you may experience, even perhaps today, some bit of um, social pressure for you to go to church on a Sunday morning in Dallas, you're not gonna be ostracized and you're not gonna come out of fear. Now, I think that's rapidly changing. But that is our reality today, and it, more than that, it's what we've grown up with, if you've grown up in this part of the country. How does that shape your view of Jesus and what it means to follow him? One of the ways, primary ways, that you might not think about, that I think is underneath all of this, is that we live in a culture that's focused on the here and now. Every day we wake up, we take a shower, we get dressed, we go to work, We live our lives and our lives are oriented around this world. And everything we do assumes that this world is all that there is. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The idea that this is all that we have, and so live it up. Get the most out of life here and now. Life is short right? And so make the most of it. But if you read the Bible and you understand the gospel, you should begin to realize that that is not true. That you and I have actually been created for eternity. Do you know that this morning? Made in the image of God, you have been created to live forever. (laughs) And what that means is this is not all that there is. There is so much more. What that means is life is actually not short, but you're going to live for eternity. 
So here's the question for us this morning. The question is, if that is true, if you've been created for eternity, if this is not all that there is, if there is a future glory that is to come, if heaven is actually real, then how does that change the way that you live today? There's a question that I love to ask people who live in Dallas, and I'm one of them. It's a question actually I began to ask as I came to faith in Jesus when I was a senior in high school. And here's the question. It's a question I want you to wrestle with this morning. I want you to really think about it. It's a very simple question, but if you answer it too quickly, you're not doing the hard work that I think we all have to do as people who live in Dallas. Here's the question. What if all of this is true? What if everything we study on Tuesday mornings, and if you're a churchgoer, if you belong to a church, what if everything we talk about on Sunday mornings, what if all of this is really true? Now, if you answer that too quickly and you say, well, of course it is, I think you're not doing the hard work of admitting and realizing that so much of what we have accepted as Christians, we just kind of take without really thinking it through and thinking, what if this is actually true? Because here's the deal. If this is really true, everything changes. Nothing in our lives can stay the same. Everything must change. And here's what's also true, I believe. If none of this is true, we should all go home right now. We're wasting our time. There's no point to going to church on Sunday morning. None of this matters. But if this is true, everything must change. And that is what the Apostle Paul is putting forward for us this morning. He's going to say, if this is true, if these gospel realities are true, then your life must change. And what we're going to see this morning is a principle we see in the Apostle Paul throughout his letters, throughout his writings. It's a theological idea. It's there in your questions, so I'm just going to say it once just so you have it and that you can run with it. It's this, that the indicative precedes the imperative. Now, what in the world does that mean? I know it's early. Indicative precedes the imperative. What that means, when you see the Apostle Paul giving instruction, giving commands, most often those commands are already rooted in a gospel reality. When Paul tells us to do something, he's not saying, do this, and then the gospel will happen for you. He's saying, this is what the gospel is. This is what God has already done for you. That's the indicative. This is the reality that is for you as a believer. If you call Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, this is true for you. Therefore, here's the command. Go and do this. That's what we're going to see this morning. Paul's going to give us three indicatives, three gospel realities And he's going to say, if these things are true, then go and do this. He's going to give us two commands, and they're very similar. And hear how I think our lives must radically change if this is all true. This is the two things he says. We are to seek the things that are above and set our mind on the things that are above. We live in a world that's focused on the here and now, a world that's focused on imminence. Philosopher Charles Taylor calls the imminent frame. But we serve and worship a transcendent God, a God who is big and mighty and majestic, a Jesus, as we've seen in the book of Colossians, who's preeminent, who is above all things, who holds all things together. More than that, we don't just worship a transcendent God, but what Paul is going to remind us this morning is that you have been created for a future glory that is to come. And if that is true, We are to seek the things that are above and not set our mind on the things that are below. So first, three indicatives, three gospel realities that are true for us, and then we'll talk about, therefore, what should we do? The first is this. You have been raised with Christ. If you are a Christian this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus, Paul says, you have been raised with Christ. Again, Paul's solution to our problem of the culture seeping into our thinking about what it means to be a Christian is this, that you are in Christ. It's our union with Jesus. Again, Paul uses that phrase over 160 times in the New Testament. It's what it means to be a Christian, that we're united with Christ. And so if we are united to Jesus, that means Christ's resurrection, we've actually been raised with him. Notice what he says, Colossians 3, verse 1. Look with me. Paul says, if you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. First thing I want you to notice, the indicative precedes the imperative. If 
you have been raised with Christ, there's the indicative. If you've been raised with Christ, then, therefore, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So if you are a Christian, you've been raised with Jesus. And if that's true for you, seek the things that are above. Now, what does it mean to be raised with Christ? How do we actually experience that every single day as believers? What does that actually look like? I want you to go, if you have a Bible, to Romans 6. If you don't have a Bible, you can use a Bible app or you can just listen. But I want you to listen to Paul's language. He talks about our union with Jesus and how we are actually connected through faith to his death and resurrection. This is Romans 6, beginning in verse 5. Notice a similar kind of language, an if-then statement. Romans 6, verse 5, he says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So again, if you've been united to Jesus, if you are in Christ, that means that you've been united to him in his death and in his resurrection. He goes on, verse 9. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So the first thing I want you to wrestle with this morning, what if it's really true? As Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, if you've been around Christianity, that should be a given. That should be obvious. But the bodily resurrection of Jesus has always been questioned from the very beginning. And I think it's fascinating to me to meet and come across Christians that if I press them hard enough, they say, well, I know we believe that, but really, I mean, did it really happen? Is that just a metaphor? Is that just kind of a a, a lofty idea that gives us hope? And what I want you to wrestle with this morning is it's really true. If you're a Christian this morning, we believe that Jesus Christ didn't rise metaphorically. This isn't just a good story. We believe he rose bodily. He really rose from the dead on the third day. And we don't have time to go there this morning, but elsewhere in the book of 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul says that if that's not true, then none of this matters. If there's no such thing as the resurrection, then we are most of all of people we are to be pitied because this is a waste of time. Why does that matter? Because Paul says that if you're united to Christ, then his resurrection is yours. And one day, if Jesus Christ, if you trust in him for your salvation, if he is your Lord and Savior, if you believe and place your hope and trust in him, you are joined with him in his resurrection and you too will be raised. Because this is not all that there is. We have been created for eternity. Again, verse 9, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 10, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Jesus died, he rose again, and death no longer has dominion over him. And being united to him, verse 11, look with me, Romans 6, verse 11, so also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You've been joined to Jesus. And if Jesus died and rose again, that means you will die and rise again too. You will have the same victory over death that Jesus does, and that should change how you live today. But notice the order. How you live today does not get you victory over sin and death. No, Jesus' victory over sin and death changes how we should live today. And the order is incredibly important. The gospel reality is Jesus rose. If you live your life now trying to earn the resurrection of Jesus, it will crush you. And I think it's crushing so many of us. 
But Paul is saying, if this is true, then your life today must change. How does the resurrection of Jesus change our life? One more place I want you to go if you have a Bible or you can just listen. Again, this is Romans chapter eight. So if you've been in chapter six, just go over two chapters. Romans chapter eight, verse 11. I love this verse so much. It's been such a, a, a balm to me, an encouragement to me, because this tells us why the resurrection matters for us today. I think we would all agree that for a man to rise from the dead requires incredible power. The greatest power the world has ever known. And what Paul is saying is that if you are in Christ, you've been joined in his resurrection. That means that same power, the power of the resurrection is now yours in Christ. Romans 8 verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, so again, you've been united to Jesus. Notice the theme. If the spirit of Jesus who rose from the dead now dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your immortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If you are a Christian, what Paul is saying is the same spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is there with Jesus on the cross, there with Jesus in the tomb, that same spirit who rose from the dead now dwells in you. And you now have the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ living inside of you. <laughs> what if this is actually true? Paul's saying it is. Right now, Christian, if you are a Christian, you have the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ dwelling in you. That word dwell means that the spirit has taken residence in you. It's decided to abide in you, to live in you. Through Christ, the same spirit that rose him from the dead is now giving you power over sin and death. And so if you're like me, you ask, well, then why is the, this Christian life so hard? Why do I keep failing? If I have the same power that Jesus had over sin and death, then why do I keep sinning? Because we are so fixated on the things that are here and now. Paul says, set your mind on things that are above, because that is our home. The second reality, first is you've been raised with Christ. Second reality, he says, you've died with Christ. You've been raised with Christ if you're a Christian. You have died with Christ if you're a Christian. Look at verse three with me. Colossians three, verse three. So go back to Colossians, we're out, out of Romans, Colossians 3, verse 3. Not only have you been raised with Christ, as you've died with Christ. Verse 3, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Again, think about it. If you've been united to Jesus, that means his resurrection is yours. It also means his crucifixion is yours. If you've been risen with Christ, you, it means you've also died with him. You were crucified with him. There's a connection to what Paul is saying to what he said earlier. We looked at this uh, last week and the week before, Colossians 2.20. If with Christ you died the elemental spirits of the world, why? As if you're still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Right? Again, notice the if then. If you've died with Christ, then why are you thinking about this world? Here in Colossians 3, he's saying, if you've died with Christ, that means your life is hidden with Christ in God. It means your life is no longer yours. Everything has changed. I want you to just listen this time again. This was Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 6. It's the same section we just looked at. He says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. To be crucified with Christ is to recognize when he died on the cross, your sin died with him. And Paul is saying, look, we are slaves to sin. And if you've been crucified with Christ, it means you've been set free. Your sin died with Jesus. And now you have been set free. In the same way that the resurrection of Jesus gives us power and victory over sin and death, 
The crucifixion of Jesus gives us freedom. It sets us free. You've been crucified with Christ. But notice the language. To be joined to Jesus is to be set free from sin. To be so connected to Jesus, to be bound to him, means to be set free from sin. But you and I, we've been trained by a world that thinks the exact opposite. That says freedom is actually found in sin. And that slavery is found in rules and regulations that are found in Jesus. Christianity. That's the world we live in. A world that lies to us every single day and says all of the things that Jesus calls us to, those are those put us in bondage. Those are oppressive and they, they restrict us. And to, to leave those things and to give yourself to the world, that's true freedom. But what Paul is saying here is that that's slavery. The world enslaves us. And we are only free when we are bound to Jesus. Puts it this way, Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, again, this apostle Paul, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Again, notice the language, union with Jesus. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul sees himself so connected to Jesus and his crucifixion that it's no longer he who lives. But he only lives through Christ. So here's the question. What are you living for today? If that is true, how does that change our lives today? Do you still think that your own life as a Christian belongs to you? And for you to decide what you do today and how you live and how you go about your, your business? Or do you recognize, as Paul says, that you've been crucified with him? <clears throat> and your life is now hidden in Christ. <clears throat> it's no longer yours. He says elsewhere that you've been bought with a price. Your life is not your own. You have been ransomed. And now you belong to Jesus. And here's the kicker. That is actually for your good. Because this world that we are so fixated on actually enslaves us. And our only freedom is found when we are bound to Jesus. The third thing I want you to know. <clears throat> Again, three indicatives. Three realities for us. <clears throat> this is the last one and maybe of all the hardest one for us to really wrap our minds around. If, if it wasn't already difficult to say, what does it mean to be resurrected with Jesus, to be crucified with Jesus? Here's the last one. You will be glorified with Jesus. You will be glorified with Jesus. This is not all that there is. There is so much more. And again, the question I want you to wrestle with is what if it's true? What if it's really true? Paul says it this way, verse 4. Colossians 3, verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, <laughs> you haven't gotten it by now. Paul's making it very plain. When Christ, who is your life, should consume you, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ appears, that's going to happen in one of two ways for you and me. Either he will take you home or he will come again before you pass away. When Christ appears, you will appear with him in glory. This is not all that there is. There is a future glory that is to be revealed to us. A glory that is found in a place that we call heaven. Now, our culture has co-opted the idea of heaven. And we've, when you think of heaven, you think of clouds and pearly gates. <clears throat> you think of St. Peter asking silly questions in order to get you in. We think of all of these crazy ideas. And what I want you to think of is, look, whatever you think heaven is, it is so much more than you can possibly imagine. And the problem is not just that we have this 
broken view of what heaven is, we are so fixated on the here and now, we can't even possibly imagine what it would be like. And so maybe you have this, if any of you have um, boys or girls, it doesn't, you know, either way, um, or you've been around them, and they'll tend to ask questions, particularly as they get older, hey, what's heaven going to be like? And usually, undoubtedly, after they ask that question, they're going to ask, is there going to be this in heaven? Maybe you've asked the same thing. So if you're around <laughs> little boys, I remember, you know, years ago, it was Xbox. Is there going to be Xbox in heaven? Now, it's an innocent question, Right? But what are they saying? Look, if there's not going to be Xbox, I mean, do we really want to go there? (laughs) I mean, forever without Xbox? (laughs) Like, who wants to do that, right? Think about it. We all have actually lingering questions like that, even, you know, big kids like us. And you wonder, is this going to be a reality in heaven? The reason we ask those questions is because we're so fixated on the here and now. We can't imagine that there's a future glory that is far more magnificent than we could ever possibly see here and now. Paul says that when Jesus is glorified, think about that, the son of God, what's it going to be like for Jesus to be glorified? He says we, as his followers, as his disciples, those who've been united in him, we're gonna be glorified with him. And if the resurrection gives us power, and the crucifixion gives us freedom, then what I want you to hear is that glory gives us hope. Because as we live in a world that's not just filled with Xbox and things that also tempt us, we also live in a world that's broken, and we feel that every day. And as we experience that suffering, we are given this precious reminder that this is not all that there is. Apostle Paul, again, Romans chapter 8, says this, Romans 8, 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so here's what I want you to hear. Some of you this morning, and I'm, I'm in both camps, by the way, so I'm, as I say this, I'm speaking to myself both times. Some of you this morning need to hear that this is not all that there is. And you need to hear that because you have been totally captivated by this world. The trappings of this life, the false promises of our idols, the idea that this is all that there is, we eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow we die, just live it up now. All of that you have just totally bought in, and you need to hear that this is not all that there is, that there is so much more for you in this future glory that is to be revealed. Others of you are experiencing incredible suffering right now. You're going through pain and grief unlike you've ever experienced. And whether that's suffering because of broken relationship, because of people, friends, family members who have died in the last year or two, because you have been confronted with the harsh reality that we live in a broken and fallen world. Some of you also need to hear that this is not all that there is. There is a future glory that is to be revealed. And that's Paul's point in Romans chapter 8, that the sufferings of this present life cannot compare to a future that is to be revealed. That when Christ comes in glory, you, Christian, will be glorified with him. So what? That's where we're going to end as we go to our table. So what? Well, what if it's all true? What if Jesus really did die? He really did rise again, and he really is going to come in glory. What Paul is saying is all of that is now yours in Christ Jesus. So if you trust in him, you place your faith in him, all of this is yours. If you have not placed your faith and trust in him, if you still wonder, did did Christ really die and rise again? Could that really be true? Then none of this is yours, and you're still on your own. And you're still going to be enslaved to this world, and when you suffer, you're without hope. But if this is true, then you have the power of the resurrection, the freedom of the crucifixion, and the hope that we have in heaven. All this is yours, and so what? Paul tells us we have to then do two things. Two things. Look with me, Colossians 3, verse 1. Notice what he says, if you've been raised with Christ, then so what? Seek the things that are above where Christ is 
seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things of this earth. You and I live lives every day that, if we're honest, are fixated on the here and now. And Paul's saying, if this is true, then you can't look down anymore. You have to look up. You have to set your mind on the things above. What are the things that are above? That you've been crucified with Christ. You have been raised with Christ, and you will be glorified with Christ. And that future glory is our home. And you've been made for it. So set your mind on that, on the things that are above, on the hope that we have with heaven, and let that be the thing that drives the way that you live today. So what is Paul not saying? He's not saying that we should all quit our jobs, although I mean some of you might want to do that. He's not saying we should all just go into a monastery and go monk. He's saying that you, as you leave here and you're going to meet in your groups and then you go to work, that the reality that you've been crucified with Christ, raised with Christ, and there is a future glory should completely change the way that you work. That the goal of your work is no longer the things of this earth, but it's our future home in heaven. That it should change the way that if you are a husband, the way that you think about your marriage. Because it's so easy for us to get sideways in our relationship with our wives and think, well, you know, I don't feel like she's just loving me the way I want to be loved. And I feel like I deserve better and I deserve more. And if she would just do this. No, Paul says, set your mind on things that are above. This is not all that there is. There's a future glory that is to be revealed and your marriage actually points to the union of Jesus and his church when he comes again in glory. Or if your parents, the way that you parent, the goals that you put before your kids, are they earthly goals or are they heavenly ones? If you are single, if you have roommates, neighbors, the way that you work, the way that you conduct your business, the way that you go about as a man, Paul says, if this is true, seek the things that are above. Everything must change. I want to leave with this and send you to your tables. This is, love this quote from Mere Christianity. This is C.S. Lewis. I want you to hear him as he wrestles with these same things. He says, most of us find it very difficult to want heaven at all. Except insofar as heaven means meeting again our friends who have died. If you don't hear anything else from this quote, I want you to hear how honest C.S. Lewis is being about heaven. I want you to be honest. Do you really want it? Do you want Jesus to come back? Or are you like, well, I kind of have some things I got to do first. <laughs> He's saying, look, most of us don't even want it, except that we want to be with our friends again. Be honest about it. Lewis is being honest about it. He says, one reason for this difficulty is that we've not been trained. Our whole education tends to fix our minds on this world. Another reason is that when the real want for heaven is present in us, we do not recognize it. Most people, if they want heaven, have really looked in their own hearts, would they know that what they want acutely is something that cannot be had in this world? And there are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. What is Lewis saying? That deep down, everything that you want has actually been given to us in Christ. The longings that you have have actually been promised to us in heaven. And the great trick is that we live every day thinking that this world is going to give us those things. And they can't. They can't. So Paul's saying, if you've been raised with Christ, if you've been crucified with Christ, if you will be glorified with Christ, if all of that is true, then set your mind on the things that are above and not on the things of this world. Let me pray for you and send you to your groups. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the apostle Paul. Thank you for this challenging, challenging few verses. And I pray for each man here that you would help us to be honest about how we really think about these things. The de your death, Jesus, your resurrection, and the future glory that awaits us who are in Christ. May we fix our minds on the things that are above today. 
and all the days ahead, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.